Hey everybody, this is the Atlantic Revolutions Lecture, which is part of our 19th century unit. Um, it is called the Atlantic Revolutions because all four that we're going to talk about kind of surround the Atlantic Ocean. That includes the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the Haitian Revolution, and Latin American Revolutions. They certainly have many other things in common, so we will see if you can pull some of those ideas out. Before we get into it, I'm actually going to tell you a couple of those ideas, but it would still be great if you can see, um, recognize these as I go along. So some of the ideas that were under attack. Uh, revolutionaries were fighting against the divine right of kings to be the boss and to rule, um, to control trade. Um, there was a fight against the privileges that the wealthy got and the other classes didn't get, and the authority of a single church. There were also some shared ideals and things that the revolutionaries were fighting for. Liberty, equality, free trade, religious tolerance, democracy, and popular sovereignty. There's a lot of overlap in all of these ideas, but these are some things that we can pull out of each and every one of the four revolutions we're going to talk about. So maybe see as we go um, if you can make any of those connections. The first one I'm going to cover in the simplest way, and that's the American Revolution. Um, it's, I'm going to cover it in the simplest way because you should, at some point in your non-world history career, um, get some more detail on this, or maybe you already have. But anyways, it took place between 1775 and 1787. And to start off, what were the problems? What were people going for? What were the revolutionaries going for? Well, it was overall the struggle for independence from British rule. The British had tightened their control over the colonies and were taxing them for everything and making laws without their consent and trying to control them from across the ocean. And um, Britain was struggling themselves in terms of being in debt and were trying to collect money. And so how did they, what did they think to do? They thought to tax sugar and tea and stamps um, and require colonists to pay for stamps to put on just about everything they bought. And this was meant to raise money for Britain, but it just developed um, resentment in the American colonies. So unrest started to show, um, show itself. Um, after the colonists tried to peacefully resolve some of these issues with Britain, there were these little flare-ups, I guess you could say, some of them bigger than others, but things like the Boston Massacre, the Boston Tea Party, the creation of volunteer armies, um, where just ordinary citizens would train and learn to be a part of an army, and they were supposed to be ready at a minute's notice, and that's why they were called Minutemen. And then finally, our triggering event was the Declaration of Independence. Now, I don't really have descriptions for any of these. Some of them you've probably heard of, but you'll learn more um, in your U.S. history class. Within the struggle for independence, the war itself, George Washington was the leader of the colonial army. So this is before the Constitution was final or was written, and then our first president was elected. So at this point, George Washington is just a general leading the colonial army. And with considerable aid from the French, which is kind of noteworthy, with a lot of financial and military assistance from the French, the colonists do beat the British. Now, it's not like the French were supporting the Americans because they believed so much in their cause. They were looking to bring down their rival, the British, and it worked. So eventually, Britain surrenders. Overall outcomes, the U.S. Constitution is written. It's the one we still have today. And we can see a lot of ideas from the Enlightenment, which influences all of these revolutions, but we can see some of those ideas in the Constitution. Ideas such as democracy, though mostly for the wealthy white guys. A lot to come on that. Um, it was also designed to prevent a, mon a monarchy type of power, so no more king. So everything in the Constitution has that in mind. How do we prevent a single person from becoming too powerful? Overall, though, there was no big social transformation in terms of classes and um, slaves and the rich and the poor and men and women, that didn't really change. But the colonists did get rid of the British control. And this was the first revolution of the new world empires. And just like that, we're on to our next revolution. That is the French Revolution. Notice the date, 1789. This is not that long after the American Revolution. And that's because the American Revolution, as well as the Enlightenment ideas, inspired the French Revolution. So this one was more of an internal issue. Instead of trying to kick out an outside power, this is the only one of the four where they were more dealing with internal conflicts. So what was going on? Well, why was France in such bad shape? King Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette were the king and queen, and society itself was divided into three estates, in other words, three social classes. 
The first was the clergy, the second was the nobility, both representing about 1% of the population, but the third was the commoners, and this was 98% of the population. However, when they gathered, which was rare, but when they gathered in their estates general, which was sort of like their legislature, but King Louis was still maintained the full power, each estate had one vote each, no matter the representation. So even though this represented 98% of the French people, their vote was no different or was held in the same esteem as the nobility and the clergy. And the nobility and the clergy would often agree. And so the commoners, again, despite representing 98% of the people, almost always lost when they were trying to re, uh, pass a resolution. Meanwhile, France was in huge debt after assisting the American Revolution and other skirmishes and, well, flat out wars with other European powers, namely Britain. Um, and so it caused a high, the cost of living to go up and the price of economic goods to go up. The bourgeoisie, which is a fancy name for the wealthy people, wanted more political power and not to be subjected to King Louis' demands all the time. So people weren't happy. The third estate was so unhappy that in 1789, they actually broke away completely and formed the National Assembly. So in other words, forming their own government of sorts. They actually wrote a new constitution as well as the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, kind of like the Declaration of Independence in that it, it was aiming to guarantee freedoms of speech, press, religion, and decrease the power of the monarchy. The revolutionaries stormed the Bastille prison in, on uh, July 14th of 1789, and this was an important moment because they released political prisoners, but mostly they were able to gather weapons and then pursue violence in the months that followed, um, burning plantations, burning documents with um, burning documents that held uh, information about dues and um, other um, bills and uh, bank records and, and so on. Um, then there was the March of Versailles in which peasant women marched to the Palace of Versailles demanding bread, better economic conditions, and demanding that Louis the 14th, I'm sorry, the 16th, recognize some of these changes that the people were demanding. Eventually, the reign of terror, terror <laughs> the reign of terror commences, in which a committee of people led by a man named Robespierre um, actually went throughout France collecting enemies of the revolution and anyone seen who is seen to be fighting or resisting against this revolutionary idea, um, they were arrested and executed, including Louis the 16th and Marie Antoinette, and they were ex executed by guillotine. So we're talking about tens of thousands of people being executed this way, including Robespierre, who eventually gained so much power that the revolutionaries get concerned that he's going to become a tyrant, and then they end up killing him. Um, so even the own pro the program that he was running, he ends up being becoming a victim of it. What were the outcomes of the French Revolution? Well, a new constitution did set up a legislature with representatives that were chosen by vote uh, to limit the power of the monarchy, but it didn't last that long because then we have this short little man called Napoleon Bonaparte, I almost said Napoleon Dynamite, Napoleon Bonaparte, who seized power in a coup d'etat in 1799. So about a year into the revolution, Napoleon takes over. And at first he does make some improvements for France in terms of improving schools, banks, and, and trying to improve religious freedom. But eventually he becomes consumed with building the French empire. And he is not really the democratic ruler that the revolutionaries probably wanted. Um, and he continues, you can see, I think you can see, I'm trying to let you see, there it is, how much he takes over. So besides taking over a couple individual countries, he also forces Spain and Italy and parts of Germany to become dependent on him, parts of Poland. He makes alliances with Austria, um, but then you can also see he never uh, gains control of Great Britain, that is one of the French rivals, and he never gains control of Russia. And so when he fails to take over Russia and he experiences his final loss in Waterloo, Belgium, let's go back there, there's Waterloo. Um, he eventually goes into exile and then dies in exile. So this happens around 1812. You can go ahead and add that if you'd like. And so he did maintain power for about 12 years. And really, this is, let's look at that map one more time. That's a tremendous amount of power that he gains in, in just over a decade. 
And now we are on to the Haitian Revolution and check out that date, 1791. We're talking about the same framework here, the same part of the, the timeline of um, leading into the 19th century. So what was going on in Haiti? Well, at this point, Haiti is called Saint Domingue and it is a, rent, a very rich French colony. It is so rich because it has most of the world's sugar and coffee plantations. These are extremely profitable crops for the French, not for the Haitians. Remember this, a colony means that the French were, um, had taken over and were controlling, or at least this half of the island. And what do plantations need to be successful? They need laborers. And do you think the French want to pay laborers? Of course not, they had slaves brought in. 500,000 slaves to be precise. So in this part of this island, 500,000 slaves dominated the population while 40,000 whites and 30,000 free but mixed race people held the positions of power and authority. Obviously there was enormous inequalities and exploitation going on and each of these groups of people wanted a revolution and wanted independence from France but wanted it for different reasons. Depending on your group, you either wanted it because you wanted equal rights, citizenship, or improved economic opportunities. So unrest starts to develop as there are rumors from France that slavery had ended. Now France did pass some laws that were meant to change the conditions of slavery and allow some people to go free, but they did not abolish slavery uh, completely at this point, but it was enough of a rumor as well as inspiration from the French Revolution itself and the American Revolution itself and the ideas of the Enlightenment. It was enough of a rumor to make the revolt happen. So a former slave, Toussaint L'Overture, sorry, I never took a day of French in my life, um, led the rebellion. And thousands, hundreds of slaves, hundreds of thousands of slaves uh, went around Haiti and burned over a thousand plantations and killed hundreds of white and free people of color. The result is that slaves did gain their freedom, though Haiti itself was still a colony of France. Napoleon sends over troops to Haiti to try to regain control of the colony in 1802. It doesn't last long. He's too busy taking over, taking over Europe um, that he doesn't put as much energy into resecuring Haiti as he probably needed to in order to um, keep control. And so in 1804, Haiti becomes fully free. Did I say, yeah, 1804. I feel like I said that funny. Um, and it is known as the only completely successful slave revolt in world history. Completely successful in that slaves became completely free. Their entire uh, nation of Haiti gets their independence from Spain and the slaves managed to, the former, or the free slaves, excuse me, managed to um, gain control of the private and state, the formerly private and state controlled land. So they get land for themselves. Other nations, on the other hand, refuse to deal with Haiti because they fear the uh, other slave revolts could occur as well. And so the island struggles to recover economically and re-engage in trade. And after the land redistribution to the free slaves, Haiti really becomes a nation of small farms producing only for their own needs and not so much in um, to be involved in global trade efforts. And it did inspire other slave revolts, but no, no other slave revolts that got the level of success that the one in Haiti did. And on to our fourth revolutionary movement, and that is the Latin American revolutions. This one's a little bit later. It, this one, this period of time starts off in 1810, but you can see it's right along that same timeline because of course it too was inspired by the American, French, and Haitian revolutions. Um, however, it was, it took, it took different forms in different parts of Latin America. Um, so many countries in South America, Latin America and South America, were frustrated with the social, racial, and political systems in place, mostly because of the Spanish Empire. So the Spanish Empire had granted different people of different social classes different powers, depending on if they were Spaniards born in Spain, if they were Spaniards who were, well, if they were American born or uh, South American born, but born to Spanish parents, and so on. You can see 
you can see here the different categories of people. We also know from the Enso Mienda system that many Native Americans were being forced to um, be slaves on plantations. So needless to say, many groups of people were frustrated with the social, racial, and political systems. Now, the educated Creoles right here learned in enlightenment ideas and decided, not decided, but were inspired to pursue their own revolutions. So looking for ideas of equality, basic rights, and not being led by kings and queens on the other side of the ocean. They also saw their opportunity because Spain and Portugal was being weakened by the Napoleonic Wars. And so the people in South America and Mexico saw the opportunity to gain their independence. And so how did this happen? Well, in Mexico, a Creole priest, Miguel Hidalgo, launched a revolt. And he demanded freedom and end to slavery and better living conditions and tried to kind of gather the people together that we are the natives and we need to draw um, or kick out Spain. Um, he was captured and executed less than a year after he started the revolt. However, the natives continued fighting and they managed to finally overthrow Spanish rule in the 1820s, though life did not change much for the Mexicans. They did not have this revolutionary change of their social class system. So a lot of the things that people were still upset about continued on for some time. South America, we also have many revolutions a brewing. This time the Creole generals were the ones to lead the revolutions and they tried to harness the power of the common people by building that sense of nationalism and trying to get people to tap into their feeling of being from South America, being from Venezuela, Argentina and whatnot. And that that is the reason why they need to band together to fight back against Spain. And so Jose de San Martin uh, led the rebels in Argentina and eventually won them independence in 1816. Um, Simon Bolivar, pardon my accent or lack thereof, led the rebels in Venezuela and won independence in 1821. Together they joined forces to finally force Spain out of Peru by 1824. And you can see in this map that they also, um, that San Martin um, this is the blue, he is in the blue line here, and so he fought for independence in Argentina and in Chile and in Peru. And then uh, Bolivar um, kind of started to the north and worked his way down trying to work on independence for Colombia um, and Peru and Ecuador and some um, Chile and uh, tried to, oh, and then, I'm sorry, finally they came together. You can see they come together and then that's where they worked to free Peru. And it worked. And while it worked, the outcome wasn't ideal. Bolivar tried to unite um, all of these countries into a, con a larger country called Gran Colombia, and it did not last because civil wars broke out left and right. Rival leaders named Caldillos posed as reformers and claimed that they were going to work for better economic conditions and better living conditions for the regular the regular man, but these rivalries um, built built to such intensity that they were constantly having coup d'etats on each other. They were constantly overthrowing one government after the other, and they were taking away basic rights to keep control, and so they really ended up ruling like military dictators. And so the class struggles continued on as well, and even though Spain was gone, the struggles continued, and the countries in South America depended, depended on foreign governments for economic investments, and this created kind of, I would say, conditions for um, disruptive and dysfunctional governments for generations to come. So let's put it all together. We are just about done. What are the legacies of all of these revolutions? Yes, we need to know some of those details and some of what happened in all of those places, but the big part are the common themes. These revolutions inspired each other, influenced each other, and so that happens around the world when one country sees another country gaining things or losing things or fighting back, it often inspires the same social changes. So what really changed? Well, there was some spread of social equality and independence, okay? So these foreign bodies were kicked out of their colonies. Um, but clear leadership and improved governments weren't always the result, sometimes, but not always. And there were definitely social groups that wanted more freedom and wanted more opportunity and didn't get it. More revolutions popped up, though many failed. Reformed governments themselves that did manage to take hold faced pressure to continue to reform and to continue to make things better. Basically, hey, 
You promised us you could do this. That's why we fought. Now we fought. We're free. What are you going to do for us? Um, abolition, so the end of slavery, is basically a result of these revolutions. And so by 1890, slavery was largely ended. Um, it was in a couple other details on that. It was abolished in most of Latin America in the 1850s, in the United States in 1865, and Brazil in 1888. So Brazil was actually the last place to abolish slavery. Um, <clears throat> slaves didn't exactly have it easy either. Just because they had their freedom didn't mean that they had riches and the best jobs. They had to share crop, which basically means they had to, they got teeny tiny little parcels of land to call their own, but then they often had to pay great fees or work on behalf of the wealthy landowners that owned the land that they were renting, so to speak. Um, so life was not necessarily better for the slaves. Nationalism started to build where people were identifying as members of their country and not necessarily as subjects of a king or a queen. And this is going to play a role um, tremendously as we go on into these countries fighting, forming, falling apart, forming new countries. And then we see the feminist movement gaining some speed and some traction as women really start to lead a lot of the rebellions and the revolts and are very active in the French the French Revolution, are very active in um, many other ways that I didn't cover here, but we're gonna see that more and more as we continue to study. So, holy moly, you just covered a whole lot of stuff. 